Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and it's a real treat and an honor to have uh, Revis Wortham here with us today. He's going to be talking about his new book, Laying Bones, which is an absolute killer. Um, it's funny, uh, Revis, some of the, someone from your publisher sent me uh, the, just a great book list uh, review that just hit. Um, and you're getting terrific reviews for this book. Um, so welcome. It's great to have you here again. And, uh, and then uh, my good friend and your good friend, uh, Joe Lansdale. What can we say about Joe? Master storyteller, Edgar Award winner, raconteur, uh, Texas gentleman. And, uh, and this is his most recent book, More Better Deals. And um, if you're truly bored, we did a great program, uh, didn't we, Joe, back in July, I think when it came out, or maybe no, earlier than that. Right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's funny, before we got started here, these guys were uh, talking about the weather in Texas and what's going on, and, and I got treated to a little bit of uh, Texas talk. And uh, so this is great. I, I'm really delighted, Joe, that you were able to come and, and talk to Revis. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll largely be, thankfully, uh, in the background, everybody. Um, but I'm going to be watching the Facebook feed. So if you have uh, questions for Revis or Joe, uh, please send them in. And I'll pop up at some point uh, to ask some of those guys. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Joe. Well, what I, I'm just going to talk about is I've been, uh, I've been reading Revis for a while. It's been longer than I thought because, you know, I, time flies by when you're having a big time. And, uh, I think the first I ever spoke with Revis was on the phone. Am I right about that or am I wrong? That, about, I'm right about that's it. right. Uh, that was back in the days when you could look phone numbers up in something called a phone book. And I yeah. found your number and I called you. Yes, you did. Uh -huh. I remember that. And uh, that was the first time I talked to him. And, it, you know, you can't, you can't always tell unless you read people's stuff. But I have learned over the years that I have a pretty good nose or ear when I talk to somebody to know if they have, you know, some, uh, some dope going, so to speak. I mean, you can't always know if they can really apply it, but there, there, you have to have something that goes first before the writing. And that's you, that you have to be a reader and that you also have to have a certain voice and a certain attitude and a certain willingness. And, um, uh, I think Revis at that point in time, he, he might've been on his last string there, you know, yeah, thinking, God, man, what, what's happening here? And I thought, you know what? You just got to stick with it. I don't remember our the details of our conversation, but I was telling him, you know, you got to stick with it, man, because I could tell this guy had something going. And uh, I was right. I was right. He did, and he didn't. He didn't. Quit. He wasn't going to quit anyway. He just called me to reinforce what he was already thinking, you know. And uh, I realized that, and that's one reason I wanted to reinforce it because it, you know, I, I just thought. I'm going to see what this guy does. And then later, if it sucks, I'll say, I shouldn't have helped you. And then if it's good, like it turned out to be, I'll say, yeah, that was my fault. Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was, I was, I, I'd been writing newspaper columns and magazine uh, articles for, mm -hmm. since 1988. And uh, to, to date, I have over 2000 of those articles and, and from wow. magazines and newspapers. And I, put, I still write them once a week. They, they come out. That's where I learned. That's where I got my voice. But I wasn't getting anywhere in, in writing novels. Uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't make it. No one, I would send these out. People would just, the, the, the agents would send them back saying, no, nope, no, nope, we, don't, we, we don't like what this is. One agent in New York City said, well, I, it has trees in it. I don't represent trees. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I was, I was, I was at my last, like, I didn't know about writers conferences at that time. And now, now today, I mean, I know they're all over the country, but I didn't know what a writers conference, I was green as grass. And so I, I, I needed somebody to talk to in, in the business. And I'd been reading Joe since a friend of mine handed me Hatton Leonard. The, I think it was Mucho Mojo or, or Bad Chili, one of those two, a long time ago. He said, you got to read this guy. He's from Texas and he's, uh, he's the real deal and you need, to, you need to talk to him. Well, he didn't realize I was I, after I finished the book that I was going to call it. So I called Joe up and I, we spent some time on the phone. And, and Joe, you really did. You, you, you. You kept me going because I think I, for a while there, I was just thinking about giving up on it and not doing it. But he encouraged a stranger that that, that Cole called him at home. I don't know, you know, I don't know if you can do that anymore or not. But uh, uh, that's what they still do. It. They do. They still, yeah. Oh, well, good, good. I, because they know, they know, they know what kind of person you are. 
And in, in addition to being a great writer, Joe is just, just a great friend. And, and he's a friend to all if, if they treat him the right way. And so, you know, that, that's the way it ought, that's what, that's the way it ought to be. That's what, that's what we grew up doing. Joe, you know, that you treat somebody like you expect to be treated. Uh, we're, yeah. we're both from similar parts of the world. I'm from far Northeast Texas, up in Lamar County on the Red River, and Joe's down around Nacogdoches, uh, down the behind good part. <laughs> the good part, <laughs> the part with the pine trees. Yeah, he's the back here. Pine trees, yeah, yeah, pulpwood country, and not too far from the rose capital of Texas. So, That's you know, right. we, I yeah. used to work worked in the rose fields for the rose capital of Texas. My God, you know, I can't even Her think about that. Dad, yeah. I pulled a cotton sack when I was little. My grandparents farmed, and, and we I picked cotton, pulled cotton sack a little bit, and I, I did that. From, not very long because I found out real quick. Number one, I had asthma and it locked me up. My doctor bills were way more than what my parents got out of me picking cotton. But the second is it was hot work, and I I thought to myself, I'm, I'm a work. I'm do this all my life. No, get your fingers up. You got these bowls, and people don't realize it's not just a little plucking a little piece of cotton out of that. Oh, no. Them damn things are sharp. At the they end are. of the day, you know, you look like you've been in a been in a fight with like one of those food choppers. Exactly. You know, you're all got your fingers all bloody and getting little yeah. cuts all over them and stuff. And yeah. and uh, I did it once when I was really, really young, just kind of my parents let me do it because I wanted to do it and I never wanted to do it again. <laughs> but I ended up picking peas and beans and I, and mm -hmm. we did what we call picking pecans. They oh, have yeah. a machine that shook a tree and all the pecans would fall out of it. And then we'd all pick them up and get paid by the pound. Yeah. And I remember I said, I don't know why they don't just put a tarp around this, pass some ropes and just pull the tracker. But like, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> we like, yeah, we That's were working right. for H.L. Hunt, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the big guy. And he oh. and I thought, well, he can't figure that out. Maybe it's best because we got paid by the pound. My mother and I used to do that when uh, nothing else was available and there wasn't any other work. And uh, I guess I was I was a teenager in early late late teens, the early teens, middle teens, late teens. And uh, so I used to do that some. So I know all those, I've done all them hot, miserable jobs, you know, and, uh, and East Texas is not only hot, it's uncomfortable because it's got humidity. You know, it, it, it's like being upside of a rabbit's asshole. It's just got so much like being fur all wrapped around your head. It's just horrible. It's like breathing a blanket, you know? It is. It's terrible. It, it, but you know, that's the stuff that, 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 I took in, I internalized it, and I filed it away. And I, I, you've seen the yeah. some of the Stephen King's, well, Stephen King's novel about a guy that gets inside of his head and he's in this big room with all these books and file cabinets. That's what I do. I just took all that, and Joe does too. You file all that yeah. back, you remember all those things. And then when you finally decide you're going to write, and the only way that you can write a novel is, is, is to sit your butt down in a chair and write and quit talking about it. Well, I yeah. took all Never that. Never talk about what you're doing. No, I took all that and, and, and found my voice, which was the hardest thing in the world to do because I didn't understand what the writing voice was. Even when I was grown, I, no one could quite explain it to me. But when I got all that together, that 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 first book, The Rock Hole, came out. And uh, man, it, it, it hit pretty it hit pretty big. I was I was that's really a, what's a good book. That's a oh, good book. You. I really love that book. It's scary too. It's kind of upsetting. Yeah, it, and, and the 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 Burroughs is like, man, I talk talk about something creepy. That is a creepy, creepy book. And then the the guy, the Skinner, you know, they think's come back, you know, in in the other one. And and I don't want to give stuff away. He's in a couple of books there. I don't want to give it away. Yeah, but yeah. what I will say is that to be a writer, what you got to do is that you got to remember who you were and who you are now, and uh, why you are what you are, you know, and and how how you became uh, where you are at that moment in time, and be able to look back. I think that if you are able to do that, you've got enough material to last you for the rest of your life. You know, that doesn't mean you don't have new experiences, but those experiences are so vivid because it's your first time of experiencing those things and feeling that cold wind on your face and that, and that rain and, and looking out and, you know, seeing a thunderstorm coming up over the trees or being out fishing and seeing mosquitoes rise up in a big, looks like a giant, you know, cloud. There's so many of them. And uh, all of that stuff sticks with you. And if you, if you have those kind of memories, and no matter what kind of story you're writing, if you bring those elements to it, it gives it a uh, verisimilitude that you might not get otherwise, you know? In other words, it'd be just the story. It doesn't mean anything. Because I, I never really thought it was the story. I thought it was the characters and the atmosphere and the style. And what you said about voice, which you have, is, is a lot harder to find than people think. I remember a, a publisher told me too, not only about voice and location, he said, 
you know, why don't you write about someplace real like Los Angeles or New York? <laughs> and I thought, well, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and, uh, but, and I just kept doing it. But the truth is, even though it's your own voice you're looking for, you don't always recognize it because there are so many voices of other writers in the way. Mm -hmm. And I love those other writers because they help you find it. And you are influenced by it. When I look at my books, I see different writers in them. But I see that those are the ingredients that I've made my own, you know, meal out of. Uh, that I've sort of blended it all together. And you don't want like a, a potpourri of ideas. You want a blend of ideas. Right. And, and then that's when you find your voice and you find it when you least expect it. But you find it through doing what you said is sitting your butt in a chair and writing. You, you nailed it when you least expect it because I had been I'd been searching I, I'd start like other writers I'd start a manuscript and I'd quit or I'd start a story and quit because it never went it didn't read well and one day I, I am I'm a retired educator of 35 years and I and and by the time I retired I was the director of communications for the Garland ISD the big one of the biggest school districts in the state of Texas but I always had to go to these meetings that had nothing to do with me. And every time I go to the meeting, I would zone out. You've been to those. I just zone yeah, out. Well, I went to some when I taught in college a little bit. Well, it's, it's the same I went thing. To one. I went to one and I said, I'm never going to another one. You can, you know, you can fire my ass if you want. I ain't doing that because I, I don't need to do this. You know, well, that was one of it. those unretired non-educators. That and well, yeah, and you you, you chose a path that, that, that served you well. And, and I, mine served me well until that day. Yeah. And I was sitting there with a yellow legal pad. And a, a girl was sitting next to me and she was writing like crazy. And she was in my department. And, and, and I said, what are you writing? You're not taking notes because these people have nothing to do with what we're doing. And she goes, well, I'm writing a newspaper column. And I said, well, for what? She goes, for the Dallas Morning News. And I said, well, congratulations. I didn't know you were a columnist. And she said, well, I'm not. She said, I've never been published, but the crap I see in the newspapers these days, anybody can write. And, you know, I had been doing, trying for years, and it pissed me off. So I took my legal, my legal pad. I told her, I said, I'm going to get published before you do. And I bet you $100 that I will. And she said, okay. And I sat there, and I'd been reading three different, three different all of it. I read, I have several books going at any time. I mean, just wherever I have to be sitting, there's a book. And I'd been reading a guy named Pat McManus. I don't know if, uh, if y'all are familiar with Pat McManus. He was one of the funniest writers i've ever read he wrote for Phil and stream and outdoor life very dry I know who he is. yeah yeah and then uh there, there was a, a guy named gene hill that i had been reading and he was he was an outdoor writer and a guy named robert rourke uh and and i'd been reading Certainly him. Robert. he was oh, a hemingway imitator he was he was and you know what i'd rather read him than hemingway and then there was this one I, guy I, I, I kind of think i go back to the original on that i well, yeah. he was kind of like a he read like a parody. What what was it? The man and the boy or the hunter and the boy? The old, man, the right? old man and the boy. Yeah. Yeah. The old yeah. man and the boy. I'd been reading him and I'd been reading a guy named Donald Westlake, Donald E. Westlake. Oh, yeah. And all those That's guys right. got in the back of my head and started talking during that meeting. And I started to write and it flowed so quickly. It, it, was, it was like a thousand words that flowed out while I sat there. And I read that and I thought, I think I have something here. And I took it and I, I, I mailed it to the Paris News in Paris, Texas, uh, where all my kinfolk are. And uh, I, uh, snail mail back in that day. I mean, I typed it on a 286 computer and I printed it off on a tractor drive. You remember those days. And then I put it in an envelope and mailed it, just cold mailed it to the Paris News. And uh, they called, the guy called me, the editor called me about three, four days later. And he said, this is good. Uh, he said, I'm going to print this and I'll pay you for it, which was exciting for me. And then he said, uh, can you do it again? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I want you to be our, our columnist for the Paris News, our outdoor humor columnist. And I, he well, said, let me see. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Will you give me that same amount of money every time? And he said, yes. And when he did that, uh, I became their columnist and I've been writing for them for 33 years. But that polished my voice writing the newspaper call so but and i, well, I, I took would, journalism I, in high school and that did it for me i think journalism was in some ways a bigger influence on me than a lot of uh, more obvious kinds of writing but writers like hemingway and like ray bradbury and and uh theodore sturgeon and, and raymond chandler and hammett and james kane and i mean i can make a list that goes on and on influenced me in certain ways donald hamilton too i mm -hmm. donald hamilton was one and yeah. a lot of them influence me, and but it all kind of comes through. And that's why you can't find your voice at first, because your voice is their voice or it's some version of their voice. And right. it's like they're like ventriloquists making you do the, you know, they're they're making you do their 
their voice. And That's true. it took a while for me to say, you know, I'm going to get that hand out of my ass and do my own writing. <laughs> and once I finally got there, I said, oh, there that guy is. I know that guy. That's me. That's me. And, and, it, and it starts to flow. And all you have to do is just open the gate and let it go. And that's and that's what happened when, when they offered me the series for uh, the Red River books. I mean, the, the, it, it flow every every time I sat down, that voice led me. I didn't. I, my characters led me. I just follow. Exactly. Along. And, and that I mean, you know, and then my third book, uh, I got to look at the title, The Right Side of Wrong. Uh, when that one came out, one of my one of my biggest honors was a reviewer said it reminded him of Donald Westlake's The Busy Body in the Fugitive Pigeon. And I thought, you know, I can quit now. That's <laughs> I achieved that level. I am so good. But yeah, and, and there's another writer I'm compared to quite often. It's a guy named Joe Lansdale. And and they call me Joe Lansdale. We have a lot in common. Yeah, we do. We do. In fact, I did get I did not get a a book published by by Joe's publisher because I, I sent it to them and they sent me a rejection notice uh, through my agent and said, uh, no, we already have a guy that writes like that. His name's Joe Lansdale. And so <laughs> Well, I really meant we wrote about the same subjects, you know. That's it, and that's true. That's similar true. subjects. Yeah, yeah, we we do. And you and you got your stories. I got I have my stories, and mine came sure. from listening to the old men up the country store back in those days when there was, was a store. You sat there and, and you you drank your RC cola and then put peanuts in it, and you you kept your mouth shut yep. and you listened, and that's what got it. That's what got. It was me. those old red skin peanuts. You remember them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and have all the little stuff get caught in your throat and nearly choke yeah, you to death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did a lot of a lot of my listening was a lot of uh, old black farmers when I was in Mount Enterprise. They had a place where that some of the people actually arrived in wagons, you know, they because they had their plows in the back and they had their mules pulling the wagon so they would go where they were going and then they could hitch their mule, mules up. But and they still had a wagon yard out back where you could turn the wagon around. But they would park there waiting for their supplies, which unfortunately came after all the white people got theirs. Right. That meant when they got their seed and when they got, you know, whatever else it was that they need that they could get there, they had to wait. So they would sit on the steps, on, on the stoop out there on those steps, because they all ran along Mount Enterprise in front of May Green store and all that, where I read my first comic book. And they would talk. And when I'd first come up, they would all look at me and, you know, They'd start talking, and then after a while, I'd come up, and they thought, "You yeah, know, this, this kid's all right," because I just sit there and listen. So I got a lot of my stories from them, and my father was a was a great source for for stories. And so the two of uh, the, the two sources there had a big influence on me, as well as my grandmother and uncles, and and my mother to some degree. She wasn't much of a storyteller, but she had a real good memory for things that had happened in her past. And so all of that along with books. And in fact, it may well be those things that encourage me so heavily to want to read, to want more story, you know? And so it, you got to have that background to bring the kind of stories that you do, you know, into fruition. And, and the, you know what? And, and they, they still keep percolating up because uh, Laying Bones is based on uh, something that actually happened in the river bottoms when I was a kid in 1964. My dad, uh, my dad's best friend was his first cousin, R.B. And he and R.B. grew up together running the hills. Well, they also got drafted together uh, and, and went to uh, in World War II. And they, they both were sent to the Japanese theater and on different troop ships. They were both sitting off the coast of Japan when they dropped the bomb. They were the invasion force. And uh, dad had no idea where R.B. was. R.B. didn't know where dad was. Well, after Japan surrendered, dad was part of the occupying force in Tokyo. And he, he was, uh, he was at... Uh, with his, with his men one day, and I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't, I'm not a military guy, I didn't serve, but my dad was with his squad, and they were at attention for, for whatever reason, and my dad looked up and saw R.B. marching past in another squad. Now, this is, this is two boys <laughs> from Shakota, Texas, and they run into each other in Japan, and they're best friends and first cousins. Well, they just, they broke ranks and, and hugged each other and got to wrestling and everything, and, and, and dad said, come to That's find out. what you out. do in East Texas, you wrestle. Yeah, it's exactly what you do. You, you wrestle when you see your when you see your cousin. And so, oh, there's my grandson. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, baby. And, and so, uh, what happened was they wound up having two weeks of KP. Dog, can I go up the ladder? Not right now. Go back again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, they're. they're 
Hey, this is live, guys. This is this is how it is. And, and you know, we're pretty good right now because there's five others in the bedroom over there trapped right now till we get finished. But uh, but but they served two weeks on KP, and those two guys ran Japan, and they, you know, they did everything they were big enough to do uh, while they were there. But then they came back, and and Dad uh, Dad handled the war pretty well. RB did not. Uh, Darby had more PTSD than most than most guys around there, and so he 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 would go across the river to the honky tonks and he would drink and try to kill that pain. It's the only thing he knew to do, and he, mm -hmm. he 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 did that for years until 1964. And uh, one morning, my granddad, who was a constable in Lamar County, got a call that they, there was an overturned car down in one of the shallow creek beds down in the bottoms, uh, and he went down there and the car was there and the body in the car was my my dad's cousin rb and so he he went off and they say he drowned that was a story that we got story i grew up with but no one ever talked about it very much i was at a funeral about two years ago talking to some relatives uh in in, in paris texas and i my dad came up and rb came up in conversation and one of the uh one of the well, co my cousins i was talking to who's is is in the middle of the late 80s I said, you know, dad loved RB. He missed him. And he said, I, I told him, I said, you know, when, when RB uh, died and drowned in that creek, uh, they'd like to kill daddy. And my cousin looked at me and he said, Rev, you don't know everything, do you? I said, don't know what? He said, RB didn't drown in that creek. There was only an inch of water in there and he wasn't in it. He said, there was no water in his lungs. Somebody, we think somebody killed him, rolled him off in there and uh, somebody covered it up. And granddad never could, never would talk about what happened. And so with that information, I kind of sat down and I thought, well, what happened over there? Yeah. And then I, I wrote my version of what happened to, could have happened to RB because they were, they were shooting dice over there. You know, anything could happen. But as I was researching this too, uh, I, Joe knows, Joe knows rivers as well as I do. He's got the Sabine down there and some of the others. Uh, we've got the red up, the Red River up in our part of the world, and and these rivers we we get rain. East Texas, Northeast Texas, and I'm going to quote Joe Lansdale: "Is a world of water, and when it rains, these these rivers get up, they twist out of their banks, and even the Red River, even though it's controlled by a dam upstream, it will still change course. And there are several." parts of Oklahoma that are now in Texas. And it's been that way for, for decades. <laughs> and so Oklahoma, they're land, but they can't get to it. And in Texas law says, you know, if it's over here, it's ours. But you know, if you guys can figure out a way to get it back on your side, you can have it do what you want to do with it. Well, that's, that's for laying bones got the, the, the concept yeah. of this honky tonk that they built on this orphan piece of Oklahoma land is on the Texas side. Texas won't touch it. Oklahoma won't touch it. And this place gets out of control. And so the, you know, the, just talking to people and filing this stuff away and listening, it will create, you know, it will give you the material to do a book. And, and you know, you, you dream about them. Joe was talking about Burroughs. I dreamed Burroughs. I dreamed about uh, a place like that for years and years and years. And then, uh, you know, my wife told me, she said, well, you needed to put that in a book. And I wrote the book Burroughs, which is claustrophobic and dark and creepy. I haven't had right. that dream since. It, it, it's now, clear with me. And, you know, I used to dream about the drive-in and being trapped in the drive-in and all this weird stuff happening. And I wrote this novel, The Drive-In, and uh, pretty much that was it. And I wrote two other novels based on the fumes from it, which I thought were quite good. But yeah. that first one came in time. And once I wrote it, those dreams stopped. They, they didn't haunt me. They just were, they, they were present. And so I let it loose. And when I did, though, it was done. That happens with me with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I'll think about something for years and years and years. And I've always said, and sincerely, I don't plot. I don't sit down and plot my novels. Nothing against people who do that, right. although they're doing it wrong. But <laughs> if you, if you, <laughs> no, I really, I'm joking. But whatever work, works for you works. But what I will say is that my subconscious is constantly plotting. Mm -hmm. And at some point it goes, hey, by the way, that, that story, that novel, it's finished. You need to yep. kind of open the spigot and let it come out. And, yeah, and, and get up and sit down and write it. You know, I, I've I've uh, written a, a, a manuscript that's going to come out probably in uh, 23. It's a it's a prequel. It has one of my characters in the Red River series, Tom Bell, and it's Tom Bell yeah. in Gladewater, Liberty City, back in 1931 during the yeah. Cold Boom. And so, you know, that's an interesting time, man. 
Oh man, it was wild. And the more research you do, the wilder you find out it was. Well, yeah, that, I've written about it a few times. I know. Yes, you have. And and all there, every one of them is a great book. And and you know, those percolated. I while we were, you know, we were locked down for COVID. Uh, one night in June, I had a dream that Joe. I don't know if you've ever had this. It it, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I even oh, yeah. dialogue. I got up at four o'clock in the time morning. for me. Oh yeah, I'd never had that happen. I got up at four o'clock in the morning, wrote over 5,000 words before my wife woke up. I wrote the entire novel in six weeks, which is unheard of for me because I usually take about six months per, per, per project. But you know that one, it, and, it, and it's it's a weird western. It's 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 got uh, it's got medicine men and and uh, dead people who I mean, are not zombies. <laughs> oh, listen, Joe, I, I should send you the manuscript. You're gonna love this one because it's right up your alley. <laughs> <I look forward, laughs> yeah, and we're, I, right now it's called Comancheria, but we'll see where it winds up before it's all over with. But you know, these are the things that that writers do that, that come so easy for me. I got into this late in the game. I, my first was published in 2011. Joe, you you were published. Uh, back in the 80s, I believe, or late 70s, 70s, was it? 70s yeah. And so, you know, some of us get to a was my first nonfiction, and then I went on to fiction by the mid, mid late 70s. Yeah, you were doing that. In fact, if you could look up there on my bookcases up here, I, most of Joe's books are up here. They, they take up a lot of space. But his, my problem with him is he, he keeps uh, writing them so fast, I can't keep, stay up with everything that's being published right now. <laughs> Uh, and, and Joe, I, I, I will publicly thank you for writing the introduction to the Rock Hole when it was re-released back in uh, October, yeah. because that uh, that 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 foreword is uh, it, it's crisp. It really is crisp, and, and a lot of, a lot of people ramble on for pages and pages, and you boiled it down, and you use phraseology that I can, I don't create, I can't create, but uh, that introduction to the rock hole really made that uh, that really. Well, you're welcome. Out. It deserved a, it deserved it, and probably a better one, you know. But uh, that's the best I could do. I always give it that. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can do at the time. You know, I, it's a funny thing you said is I often dream complete dreams. I, I dream more better deals, and I wrote it in about five weeks, and it's been another week going back over it. But I just got up, and started typing that story, and it was like as soon as I put my fingers on the keys, it was there. I've had every once in a while, I'll have one that I sort of have to, you know, pull it out of the the well, you know, with a with a hand over hand rope pull. But yeah. most of the time, it it's for me, it's just there, and I start writing it. And and at part time, I'll be working on another short story and sometimes another novel. Um, you know, I wrote one that's coming out called uh, Moon Lake. And Moon Lake's the hardest novel I ever written. I don't mean it's my best. I don't know. A lot of people love it. The publisher loves it. My agent loves it. The people that have read it involved in the, the industry love it. And it's one of those I really don't know. I figure yeah. it's pretty good. It's long for me, but I had a lot of trouble writing that one. And I don't know if it's because I needed that laser surgery I just got that makes the reading more comfortable yeah. or if it was just the, the weight of the COVID and all of the stuff going on. But um, I'd get up every day and I thought that novel, I mean, I, I used everything I had and I wrestled, I punched, I rolled and I, you know, that thing, it, I thought it had my ass whipped for a while there, but I just wouldn't quit. You know, I just kept going at it because, you know, I don't like to quit anything when I'm, no. unless I realize it's a turd, then I'll get rid of it. But I don't like to quit, you know, and I finally got it done. But that novel did not come to me in one big piece. It came to me in segmented dreams and a lot of the segments that came to me were useless or they were segments that I wrote and threw away which usually you know I'm pretty close to what I'm going to do first time out like more better deals I just wrote every day and it was finished you know yep. but this one man it was so it but it was still it was inspired by dreams mm -hmm. and the dreams were really random this time and I think too I'd gotten spoiled by these dreams that organize themselves and yep. I don't know if, if you're like me but I'm like being a director of a film if I'm dreaming something and I feel like it's going off, I'll, I'll just go, okay, stop in my brain and go back and fix it and keep going just like I'm editing. You know, yeah. I do that just like I'm a, a film editor. I, I've done that. I've gotten up and gone to the bathroom, come back and go back to bed, and then it picks up where I want it yep. to pick up again. Yeah, yeah. me too. And, me you know, too. I, I, I often will write a chapter in these books that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty linear like you are. You read what you wrote the day before and then you do the day's work. Right. But every now and then a chapter will come to me and I'll sit down and write that chapter and just put it aside. It's not a short story. It doesn't fit anywhere, but my subconscious works on that. And then I'll get to a stopping place and the 
I get oh, that. I've got to read, and I'll just take that out, pull it back, plug it in, and it fits perfectly because it's your subconscious. I don't try to. I don't try to drive my characters. I don't try to drive my story. No. I think it'll die if you do that. You have to. You have to follow. It's like it. pushing chess pieces around. If you do that, it doesn't feel like real people. It yeah. doesn't feel like real motivations. You know, it's just it, it, again, it's the it's the puppet. You know, and what and you're somebody else is working it, and you're just borrowing from this and that. You're not borrowing from the things that count. You're not born from your own life. You're not born from the influences that matter. You're just trying to make it happen. And, uh, and you know, I've been guilty of that before and, and thought, you know, what's wrong with this story? I'll tell you what's wrong with this story. I'm not doing the story. I'm doing, I'm, I'm pushing it. And, uh, you know, I think when you've been doing this for a while, there's a level that you don't fall below and you know, you're going to hit that level. And so you've always tried to push yourself to hit a higher level but I'm also fully aware. I never try to beat the last book I wrote. I just think that's a, that's no. a loser's approach. I just say, this is the story I want to tell. And I can't beat the last book I wrote if I'm writing something very different, mm -hmm. because what do I compare it to, you know? And so I try to, I I've said it before and I mean it. I write like everybody I know is dead. I'm not interested in their opinion. I don't want to, I don't want anybody to tell me shit. Then when I get done, I hope they like it. Then I, then I feel, you know, that I, I'm at the mercy of, of maybe somebody <laughs> liking it, but I can't write with considering about agents and editors and markets and, and the bestseller list and all that stuff. Cause that's just not who I am, you know? And the more you, I, I felt like, you know, when I younger, I try to hit that bestseller list. I would just write something that was so derivative, mm -hmm. you know, and I wasn't hitting what I wanted to do. If I hit the bestseller list, I want it to be on my own terms, not on, you know, this sort of like, again, pushing those chess pieces around. Exactly. You can't, you can't chase what everybody else is reading right now because that changes so far out. You know, you and I will, we'll finish a manuscript and it may be a year or two years before it hits the shelves. And so if you're trying to find, mm -hmm. trace the trend, you're not going to make that. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I learned something for you and I have a, a mutual friend also that I learned from uh, a few years ago, he and I were talking and, and uh, a guy named David Morrell. I think uh, most everyone. Oh, knows yeah, him. David, yeah. Yeah, David, David gave me some good advice. He was, actually, he gave a room full of people some good advice, but I listened and I, I filed it away. He said, if you, if you get to a point in your writing and your, your story stalls and your characters stall, he says, it, it, there's no such thing as writer's block. What you've done is you forced your characters into doing something that they don't need. Exactly. To Throw that chapter out, back up and start again. I don't believe in writer's block for me. I believe I, there may well be people who experience it. I'm not going to belittle those losers. But what I will say is that I'm, uh, you know, I, I just don't believe in writer's block for me. I'm joking, of course. I do believe there's some people that, you know, maybe psychologically they have trouble. But most of the time I have writers drag sometimes where it's coming a little slower or uh, maybe that scene isn't as clear because, and I, I feel that way primarily because everything usually comes, I don't want to say easy, but it comes very fast and, and full. And, and then all of a sudden when it doesn't, you know, I feel like, well, maybe I'm, this isn't so good. Maybe about halfway through everything, I think it's awful. Oh and, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. And so then a little bit later, uh, it'll start picking up again and it's fine. But a lot of people, they refer to writer's block any day they don't want to work. That's mm -hmm. not writer's block. That's you not working. Yeah. Or they refer to writer's block as any day when it's difficult. Well, you know, nobody said it was going to be easy. I mean, you should have got a degree and taught somewhere, you know. But it's it's one of those things is that writer's block is once you convince yourself it's real, you'll have it. I guarantee you. But what if you think it's not real or you understand? It's, it's like saying you're poor. Uh, and we never said that. We said we were broke. Yeah, that meant things would get better, and it's the same way. You're not blocked; you're stalled. Mm -hmm. Yep, that, that, that's absolutely right. There's so much out there to write about. I don't have the time to write about all the stories that are rattling around in my head right now. I had a couple pop up today that I just uh, novel, ideas that could turn into novels, but I just don't have the time to to, to do it. You know, because when you're working on your manuscripts, as many as you got have going, I, I have three or four right now that I'm working on. You know, I, you don't want to add anything else to that list till you get something off your plate, and that's that's how yeah. that's how it works for me anyway. Do you guys too. mind if exactly. I jump in just for a second here? Please. Yeah, um, I was just wanted to, to ask you both uh, a little bit about um, about Texas in the 1960s. Um, you know, Revis, obviously the series is set during that period from the first book. And by the way, this is the uh, the really attractive uh, reissue with Joe's intro. It does look and good. And then we'll also, we'll, 
also say a little bit about uh, about your other series. You know, and this is the most recent one in that. Yes. But um, you know, it seems like for both of you, and I, you know, I know have been reading Joe for a long, long time, and and you know, the '60s and the experience of the '60s seems to be Joe. I don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like such a a part of your DNA. And um, it is. You know, in recent years, you've written these uh, really exquisite Cap and Leonard short stories. They kind of go back in time into that period um, and yeah. you're talking about r race relations you're talking about what it was like in the 60s um, I don't know can you guys both maybe talk about uh, you know you're in different parts of the state but how that living through that time was for you and how it I'll let Ray go first here, then I'll... well you know uh, that those those years formed us you know we I, I was a victim of rock and roll uh, it got a hold of me when the Beatles came in, and, and, and my, a lot of my books, most of my novels, have the music in them to set the tone, to set the, the time, because music's a great time machine anyway, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and you hear a song, you're immediately transported back to the, that, that car in that drive-in with that girl, or, or you know, some, something really cool happened to you, and that music was going on, so, you know, the music helped define a lot of what I write about, but, you know, Texas, it, it was... Texas was was a not, not a microcosm, but it was just a small snapshot of the entire country. You know, uh, racism was rampant uh, in Northeast Texas, and I know it was in East Texas also. Uh, there were uh, you know there were cap cafes and restaurants where uh, uh, you know, black folks had to go through the back door, not the front door. Um, and yeah, that's, absolutely. That's in, yeah, and that's in my books. My, one of my major characters is John Washington. Who was uh, who was a real guy? He was he was a huge. He, he looked like the guy in Green Mile. He was that big to me as a kid. <laughs> I mean, he was a hoss. And uh, and I I wanted to show the struggles that he had as a lawman in those in the 1960s. And he worked with my granddad very closely. Granddad was kind of a Renaissance man, and so they they worked very closely together on on several cases. And I would see John. So you know, we we had we had that world. You know, toward the late. Late '60s, you know, the the rock and roll got darker. You know, the, the war spun up. Uh, there were, you know, there were protests. There were riots. Uh, riots starting in '64 and through '65, '66, and Watts and in LA and those types of things. So, you know, what we're seeing now, uh, in a lot of ways, is is a, a resurgence of that kind of thing. People trying to make their point, trying to get everybody to listen to what they have to say, which is what we were trying to do through the music, through the kids, you know, the, the hippies, the marches, the rock and roll. And so, but it's at the same time, it was pure Americana. That was, that was East Texas, Northeast Texas, that, where I grew mm -hmm. up. My granddad would borrow money on a handshake from the bank. You know, people, yeah. people, people respected each other. There was courtesy. And uh, it was it was it, it was probably more idyllic than the uh, less idyllic that I you know I choose to remember. But it was a great time and a great place to grow up. Well, nostalgia is a big liar in a lot of ways. But there's yeah. so many wonderful things about growing up then because you're young and you don't know how bad things are. And it's not that I think the world's bad. I'm one of the I'm not an optimist, but I'm a positive guy because I don't want to be an optimist because the opposite of that is pessimist. And mm -hmm. both of them seem to be extremes, you know. And it's, uh, I was a 60s guy, I was a Vietnam War resistor, I was drafted, I refused to go, I nearly went to prison, it's a long story, I've told it before, I won't bore people with it. But the music I first really remember hitting me was, was Hank Williams, and he was already dead, you know, and they were still playing him, and Ernest Chubb, and all that stuff, and then along come Elvis Presley, I thought, what is that? Mm -hmm. And then that led to me listening to these guys called Muddy Waters, and all of these, uh, you know, uh, black musicians that... I, I would catch when when the weather was right, you could tune in to some of these channels that played black music, you know, race records, they called. Them. Yep. And uh, so that all influenced me. And then, you know, when the Beatles came along, that was not only a, a musical revelation. I didn't really like the early Beatles much. I've learned to. It was when Sergeant Pepper hit that I all of a sudden said, whoa, boy, something's going on here. Yeah. And then the White Album, that's my favorite album by them. But all of that, begin to affect the cultural aspect. I mean, I had hair all the way down, you know, the middle of my back. I was, um, you know, like I said, I was a Vietnam War resistor. I was in civil rights stuff. I mean, I was all of that stuff. And it was especially hard being where I was from because I wasn't, I wasn't dressing like everybody else. I didn't look like everybody else. I didn't have the same, I was an atheist on top of that to just make it special. 
And so there was all of this stuff. And, you know, I, it, it was a different for me. But East Texas, though, it, 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 it's always been a fascinating place to me. And, and I do sometimes get offended when people think that there's, you know, there's this line and everybody in the South is this way and everybody in the North is this way, as if during the Civil War, everybody rose up in self-righteous indignation to change the nation. That doesn't mean any defense for the racism in the South at all. But racism was rampant throughout. It was worse in the South because of slavery. But, you know, you had people who didn't want to serve with black soldiers. They didn't even want to have black soldiers in their army, which was a bad idea to not do it because once they added them, that made a big difference, you know. And, and still, they didn't trust them. So, so, in other words, there's always been this kind of white, we're better, and, you know, we're going to be kind to them. It's kind of like it's way, the way they did the American Indian. We're, we're your father white guys. Instead of like, you know, we're all equal people and we're trying to work this thing out here and figure out our social and cultural differences, you know, and, and so to me, all of that's always intrigued me. And I, and I knew old men that had the worst language, worst racist language in the world that would never mistreat somebody black and would deal with black people all the time. And that was people they considered friends. And then I knew people that were just as smooth as they could be in the way they talked, and they wouldn't have a black person in their yard. I mean, it was... Yeah, all of it's so mixed and complicated, and that's what fascinates me about, about characters and about language and what scares me these days when you have things where it's all got to be this way or that way or that we can't talk about bad things when exactly you should talk about bad things to keep them from happening again and that you should look at it in a real and honest manner, not some manner that's politically correct. And I'm not against political correctness in certain ways, but I'm totally against political assholeness. You know, <laughs> I just think that you don't need to look at everything as them or us because people are more complicated than that. And I told this story before, but my father was a racist and, and he was a verbal racist, terrible stuff. But, you know, if he didn't have black customers for his, uh, his uh, mechanic business, he wouldn't have had any. And when he went squirrel hunting, he always brought extra squirrels or extra fish for the black people he knew. He wouldn't call them friends, but they were, you know. And uh, I, I saw him one night uh, stop in the middle of a rainstorm when people, black car, a car full of black family had broken down. And my father stopped and got out in the rain when another white people were going by and just yelling horrible, horrible things at these poor people who were in this storm and my father got under that car and fixed it with water running over him and it was cold and when he got back in the car he was shivering and I said to my dad I, I just don't even say that I just looked at him and he knew because I'd heard all this racist rhetoric and I'm always saying well you know I don't I, I love little Richard I like you know I like this and I like that and later I, I like Muhammad Ali but at that point I was younger than that and he said well those, those uh those kids were wet those kids were going to get cold or something like that and I, I knew who he was. And, to, and for us to all boil this down to some sort of woke moment, when woke in concept is wonderful, but when it has rules, it's not. Or you have people in publishing that goes, we're not ever going to use this word, no matter if it is meant to show you the ugliness of that moment in time. And so to me, that's what scares me because that's how things like this repeat themselves. And when everybody starts saying everybody's equal now, it's a perfect playing field. No. And that's why you have Black Lives Matter. You know, they're tired of that shit. And things are better than they were when we were growing up because they couldn't go into a restaurant. They couldn't uh, go to the same water fountain. They didn't have the chance to work jobs that the lowest of what we call white trash, that'd be me. And we couldn't, we could work jobs they couldn't get. Some of the worst jobs you can imagine and they couldn't get them because their skin was black. So I'm, I'm not for this all, let's make it all shiny and, and cool because you don't wanna forget. I mean, it depends on what you're writing, but if you're writing about history and you're trying to write about those things that matter, those things that wounded you, and the biggest scar on my soul is racism, you need to write about them with honesty. You know, a word is a word, it's the context that makes all the difference in the world. No. See, that's what that's what Joe and I do. We we I, I I'll flinch a little bit. Joe will flinch less than I do. But we write about that time period, and we write about those people as honestly as we possibly can. And I think that's what makes our uh, makes our books so readable. Our dialogue is true to the to the, to the area. We're losing that. We're losing our our uh, 
our, our accents here in, in uh, North and East Texas. Yeah, we used to have accents till we growed up. So, somebody said I had one one time, but I thought, I don't know what they were talking about. You know, we, Joe and I were, we were in a truck with a friend of our, a mutual friend of ours, Saba from, from Italy. Uh, pronounce oh, yeah. his last name again. Uh, Saba Pazzini. Pazzini. And Joe and I got to talking and we, we talked for about 10, 15 minutes. And finally, Sa Saba said, would you guys stop for a second? I said, what? He goes, I haven't understood a word y'all said in the last 15 minutes. What are you talking about? Yeah, he spoke good English. And he spoke and, good English. And the problem is, if I get around people from Gladewater for more than a couple of hours, then I start talking like this. And, and this whole idea about drawling in East and North, East and Texas is not true. That's West Texas and North Texas that draw. We bark. We bark. We, know, we, 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 we we're choppy. We're choppy. We and we talk faster too. We talk, yeah, you know, we would get talking real fast. We use we use phrases and words that people don't understand. You know. Yeah, it's, it's five different dialects in in Texas and probably variations <laughs> thereof. And some of that is disappearing. Like my son doesn't have nearly as much of a an East Texas you know accent. He has some. My daughter, she's she's got it, and it's probably because she's a country singer. But mm -hmm. you know, she sounds like uh, you know she's from East Texas for sure. There's no doubt about that. You know, and we my wife it. doesn't have a bunch of one either. Yeah, yeah, we just embrace it. We go with it, you know. And there, there's folks that I'm not ashamed of my of my accent at all, you know. No, not at all. I I, I knew a girl. Uh, my wife uh, knew a girl. Her name Donane, and Donane talked like this all time. And you know, I understood everything she'd say. But if you put it, if you put it on TV these days, they put subtitles under Joe and I and some of these other folks. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question, Patrick? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They do. They have put subtitles under me. <laughs> I think I'm very clear. <laughs> I am too. I know exactly what I say. <laughs> well, uh, Revis, can you talk a little bit about uh, just a little bit about the protagonist? I know you've talked a lot about him before, but uh, Ned Parker. Uh, is there a lot of Revis in Ned, or is he more? Where does he come from? But Ned, Ned was, was, was loosely based on my granddad, who was, who was a farmer and a constable uh, in East Texas from the 40s all the way up until uh, the early 80s when he retired. And so uh, I watched him. I'd go out on calls with him as I got older. I learned uh, uh, about his job. I learned about the things he dealt with. You know, constables back in those days, it was they, they, you know, it was mostly drunk driving or you know, some minor break-ins on occasion. Uh, usually, as you know, family squabbles, they have to settle down. And so we had we lived uh, at his house. Uh, he had a party line in his house, which is kind of not good for a constable. But I think there were three other people on that line. And so Yelder, get I, off the line, God damn it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and every time his phone rang, you knew that the lady down, down the line, you hear her pick it up so she could hear what yeah. was going on because she wanted to be in the know and then she'd call everybody else. It was our, their, their, it was their form of Facebook, you know, it got, it got the information out really fast. And so, yeah. you know, I would look, I would watch him and I watched him deal with people and, and, and I watched him deal with drunks and, and people that wanted to fight. And, and he was so smooth and so cool. And then he did what he needed to do and, and dealt with folks. I, I think truly I, my, my Ned Parker, uh, he'll shoot you at the drop of a hat, you know, just like happened Leonard will. But I, my granddad only pulled his pistol once as far as I know that he, he told me about. And it was when he pulled a, guy, a car over, there were four guys got out and all of them had weapons. And so he, he, uh, he pointed to one guy and he said, I'm going to shoot you first and, and then I'm going to go work on the other three. And when we're done, I'm going to still be the one standing there. And, uh, people, he, uh, people tell it, still tell that story today. And so Ned Parker was, was that guy. He was also married. Uh, my grandmother was half Choctaw and, and I, I, I didn't realize it was a mix of marriage when I was a kid. And I, I don't really, I don't even think of it that way, but I had someone point that out to me, you know, you said your granddad was married to, to, uh, to an Indian up on the red river. And, you know, some people, they didn't kind of take to that. Although we all have, uh, we all have the, you know, the, the lineage. In fact, here, here, here's a strange one, Patrick. My lineage and my daughter's lineage goes back to um, Joe. Joe is is related to my daughter from my first marriage, and so you know that's that's East Texas for you. You you can't talk about anybody because you're kin to them, you know. And that's that's yeah. that's the world we write about. And so so you know Ned Ned dealt with all those things, and and he dealt with the racism and uh, in, you know in the rock hole they want to go have a hamburger when they pull up in front of a hamburger store over in uh, Oklahoma there's a sign up there that says no no dogs or Indians allowed and you know, the friend of mine he experienced that and he said what hurt him worse was he had dogs above the Indians and you know, we were second even <laughs> dogs and you know yeah. so Ned lived in that world he saw that world but but he loved kids 
He loved people. He, he'd, he'd be up the store all the time. And so I hung a lot on, on Ned. Now, as far as me being in Ned, very little, very little of myself. You know, people see a lot of top, my, my protagonist, my young, my young boy in me. And a lot, a lot of me is in him. You know, uh, I, 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 I use that as a framework. And then, and honestly, I use a lot of those experiences I had when I was a kid as the experiences that top dealt with, because why go make something up if I know it firsthand? You know, it's funny. Yeah. Um, you think of, I talked to Joe quite a bit about this because we're both big history, history buffs, especially Western and history. Um, just how, how close we really are to that frontier period. You know, you're just talking yeah. about um, this is your, your grandfather, right? And, right. you know, the period from the 40s to the 80s. And what a fascinating chunk of time that was to, to, you know, to be in your prime. Um, you know, you think about it, the early part of that in the 40s, there's still plenty of uh, elderly Civil War veterans kicking around. Maybe not plenty, but there are some. I think the uh, last one died in the 50s, if I remember. In the 50s, yeah. yeah. I think now, the last living one died in the 50s. Yeah. And yeah. I, I could be wrong on the, that exactly, but I think I'm right. But these I people saw, a little longer. Yeah, the people I saw a photo of them in a parade. I think you're right, oh, yeah. Joe, in the late, yeah. in the late 40, a couple, you know, 10 or yeah. 15 of these old guys. Yeah, but certainly the beard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Certainly well, the you know, Indian my dad was born too. in 1909, so he wasn't, but just a few years from when they talked about the closing of the frontier, but, you know, there wasn't just a line drawn in the dirt. I mean, when they lived in East Texas, my father still rode horses, and they, they had buggies and wagons. He told me when he saw the first airplane, which was a biplane, you know, and I, it was probably a carnival or something where they were doing it, you know, I, and I, I wish I'd paid more attention to that, but it was, a, it was an impressive moment for him, you know. <laughs> and he grew up, reached his adulthood in the Great Depression. So, I, you know, he wasn't that far from the stories that his uncles or great uncles told him about the Civil War. Those guys were still alive, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they may have been old men, but they were still alive. And uh, it was amazing. And, and about uh, and, you know, I had my DNA done. We'd always been told that we were Native American. We did not. We were not. We were everything else. I mean, I'm Romanian. I'm, I'm uh, Southern Italian. I'm, I'm Turkish. And, and, and that's all. And, and uh, I am a, a sort of South American. So maybe there's uh, a South American Native American. So maybe that but a little bitty bit, you know, that, that little spot in my eye. And then uh, Polynesian, which is interesting. And, and when the rest of it is uh, like a full third of it is Irish, as you would expect, and uh, Scottish, British, in other words, now and uh, Spanish and Portuguese and, and all of that. And then another bunch is all Viking, you know, Swedish and Norwegian. And, and uh, it, so, I mean, DNA is such an interesting thing. And it's so weird that we get so uptight about people that we consider different. Yep. So we're all different. We are, we're all a blend. And, and you know, that blend came from, from the Western, you know, the, the Western expansion, you know, the, the, all the people that came over, you know, they came over looking for a better life and they, they hung around yeah. the East coast for a while. And they thought, Hey, there's free land. Let's all go West. But people think that, you know, half the cavalry soldiers were, were not just white guys. They were a mix of mm -hmm. all, all languages, Germans, Italians, you know, they were a mix of people in the Buffalo soldiers. So, but a lot of people think that the West died out and, when the year 1900 rolled around, most people don't know that the last the last Indian attack in on Texas soil was in 1923 or 22 yeah. 1923 or 23. Uh, so Madronos band that had been hiding down across the river and they came uh, they came up and, and hit uh, hit a little village down on the Rio Grande down in there. And so you know what we write is maybe they're not pure westerns, but they are westerns in 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 many senses. You know, and that was. That's wow. what we are. We're Texas. We're the you know, way. I use the tools of that, you know, and, and one of the things is people say, well, your novels have got a lot of violence in them. You wouldn't do violence. I said, no, I wouldn't, but I'm writing crime novels, man. Mm -hmm. they, they got crime in them. And I oh. said, the heroes are not always just perfect kind of people. I don't consider Happ and Leonard, you know, role, role models, at least in the standpoint of how they deal with, you know, people by killing them, right. some, which they do sometimes, you know, but the, there, the, there is a sort of morality play at work. And it's all a kind of metaphor for a bigger idea. And, you know, if you take it literally, then uh, that's on you. That's, that's yep. not on me because I make it very clear that it, and, you know, sometimes I, I think the stuff reads very much like a metaphor or like a, a morality tale. And strangely enough, I think that I was so influenced by 
the Lone Ranger and, and the Rifleman and, uh, you know, Wanted Dead or Alive and all those things, which were always about 30 minute morality tales, nearly yeah, every were, one of them. They were, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly. And you know what? We're, we're right to entertain. If, if I did a police procedural and you watch these guys, you read about these guys investigating for 300 pages, you'd, you'd be pulling your hair out or throwing it against the wall. You know, that's not what we do. We, we, we write to entertain. And so we, I have these big finishes. Joe has these, these dramatic endings. That's what we want, though. We want, we want justice at the end of the book. And that's what I think we provide. Yeah, you know, it's, it's metaphorical uh, justice. Yes. Yeah. What I think what we're all probably fascinated with is that period, you know, before, right before television, you know, that, that, uh, the pulp era, mm -hmm. you know, when, when yeah. these, uh, these writers were, were writing in all genres, you know, you'd have, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. people writing hard boiled detective stories. You'd have people writing Western stories. And I, I love that you. stuff. Oh yeah. yeah weird yeah. stories. Uh, yeah, I most of it's just terrible, terribly written, but the best of it's awesome. And if I, I was that. about 12 back then, oh my God. And, and if I was growing up in that market as a writer, I would have been like writing all over the place. I'd have oh, been, yeah. I, you know, Andrew Bax and I were talking to man, we'd have been kings back then. We could have written all over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Revis, uh, can you talk a little bit, because we, we've talked mostly about um, about your other series, but can you talk about, um, you know, the uh, the Hawk the Hawk series and, and kind of, you know, the Texas Rangers, obviously they're iconic, figures in our in our national history and our identity uh can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with this series as opposed uh to the the ned parker series yeah the hawks hawks the sunny hawk series featuring my my ranger uh sunny hawk uh they're they're pure thrillers that's that's what they are they're they're a rocket ship ride from the beginning to the end you know uh, again talking about david morell he and i were on, a, on an interview uh, panel together and someone asked about what's the difference between a mystery and, and a uh, uh uh, a thriller and and his you know we all know the mystery you look you look for the bad guy you want to find out who who the person was that committed the crime well the thriller you know who committed the crime right at the outset and david and i kind of looked at each other and nodded when 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 that came up because it because that was my answer it's a roller coaster ride. i know who the bad guy is i'm just gonna i'm along for the ride until they take the bad guy down one way or the other and that's what this is that's what this is all about uh sonny's a contemporary texas ranger uh they're they're my version of westerns they take place mostly out in uh uh, the Big Bend or down the Rio Grande. Uh, but my the, the third book in that uh, series, Hawk's Target, that won a Spur Award last year, uh, it, the, it started in Big Bend and in, in up into uh, Amarillo, Texas. And then it went all the way down to Comanche, Texas and wound up not far from Joe. The climax was in the deep, uh, in deep east uh, Texas, not far from Jasper, where you know, we, we went, run into a, a bunch of Cajuns that are down in those swamps down in there. And, and I, there's everything in the world in that one. I threw the whole, I threw the whole trash can in. And so, you know, Sonny, Sonny is not your typical ranger. He's not assigned to one district. He's kind of one of the, I don't know if you've ever played softball back in college. Uh, my favorite position was a rover. I didn't have a, I didn't play bases or outfield. I, I went uh, between left and right field. I, I was running all the time. That's Sonny Hawk. He's a rover. His, his commander sends him to where problems are, like they used to do back in the old Ranger days. You were one riot, one Ranger. And so Sonny, Sonny's a family man. He uh, he deals with the uh, with with the crimes down along the border that uh, don't get much don't get much footage on TV. But he is he has his own blend of justice. And Sonny, unlike what we can do, Sonny is not opposed to stepping across the border to, to, to gather information on a, on, a, on, a, on a crime, which is what happens in the last one, Hawk's Fury. He goes after a drug king, who uh, the head of a cartel. Uh, he's trying to find who killed some people up here uh, who's killing Border Patrol agents, which is based on a true story. And so he, he goes to the border finds a, a police officer he's worked with on the, on the Mexican side of the border, and he crosses over to go uh, ask questions and, and do a little research and, and work on this. But what happens once he gets over there is uh, he can't get back. The cartels are after him. And so Sonny has to work his way back to, uh, to the Texas border with, with the person he's arrested, which you can't do. But, you know, again, we're, it's, this is entertainment. This is what it is. This is fun. It's a fun ride. So the Sunny Hawk series, uh, uh, the, the fourth one of Hawk's Fury uh, that, that came out in, in May. And it's gotten, a, it's gotten a great response because people just like that 
that swashbuckling kind of guy. You know, I guess that's what he's kind of a Texas Errol Flint. He'll wade into it. Now he's, he's impulsive. He gets in trouble all the time. Uh, he's, he's, he's not a planner. He, he's like Joe and I, who, the way we write. He gets in the middle of it and sees how it comes out on the other end. But it has it is, worked out well. He's got, gained quite a following. You know, you know uh, we were I having say a... one thing that you, I'm sorry. Please. I, I was just going to say one thing. It's talking about a difference in a thriller and a mystery. But I've read thrillers that were mysteries too. And I say the definition is it reads faster. There you <laughs> go. That's <laughs> fast. We had a conversation with uh, with Ace Atkins last night. Yeah. yeah a terrific, I like Ace. Terrific yeah, writer, great guy. And, you know, he's writing, you know, he continued the Robert B. Parker franchise. Mm -hmm. And it's done a just a great job, but also writing his own, uh, you know, mystery series yeah. set in in uh, in uh, you know rural um, Tennessee uh, yeah. I know I'm, I'm embarrassed if I have the state wrong <laughs> but uh, you know the, it, it's basically a modern version of a western hero you yeah. know and uh, and we were talking about right now in the in the current climate that we're in uh, I think there is a real you know demand for a return to characters that have this sort of some sort of moral code you know I don't want to put too yeah. fine a point on it, but um, you know that have integrity, that have uh, yeah, certain uh, ethics. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think uh, it's right. This is what we try to write. We, 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 my characters are are the people that I want to come save me, to be my friend, to be someone I can hang out and talk with and, and to visit with. You know. Uh, we all we all write writers write about. Uh, I heard someone say writers write about uh, what they've been. They've all been damaged in some way, and they write about the damage that has been done to them. I think a, a lot of times when I was younger, uh, Joe Joe is a, is a uh, is, is master in self defense. I am not. I was that little asthmatic kid, so I had to, I had to deal with with problems on my own. Uh, and in several instances in my life, I wish somebody had been there to come stand beside me you know to, to be there with me and that has you know and if that's affected me over the years and so you know things i write about my my guys always have somebody to lean on you know i don't have this one great strong guy to take care of everything he has friends he has relatives he has uh he has acquaintances that will stand beside him and that's what that's what we all want we want somebody to stand next to us to, to be with us and through thick and thin, you know, and whatever it is, you know, Joe knows if he, if he has, a, if he needs me, he call me. I, I'm driving that though. Just, yeah, I, I might have to load the trunk up with shotguns and come out there and help him out that way. Cause I'm not going to chop socket. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's, that's what you do. Bring, what bring you do. the hound dog. Now bring, yeah, that's exactly. Bring that dog. Let's go find him. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's true. In my books, so though, there's a lot of characters. Some of my books, I don't want to be with those guys. I mean, I think, but they represent people that I've known or people that I have suspected of certain things. Like yeah. the guy in More Better Deals, I think he's kind of likable in some ways, but when you know his inner tickings, they, you know, he's got some, got some things that, that don't make him all that lovable, you know? But uh, I, I, in that That's case, I, 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 knew I think it's just fun, you know? Well, it is fun. I knew a guy, and I'll, I'll never reveal who he is. He kept two bags of lime in the back of his car all the time. Now, you know, there's a whole story unto itself. And and I know that's I already see where that's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what? The, some of those were new bags that I saw back there, too. <laughs> he might, maybe he was using them in an outhouse, John. Uh, you know, uh, Joe, yeah. maybe that's what he was for. Doing that, put a Put a little, a little bit of bucket of lime down in yeah. the shitter. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they put that on top of a body. <laughs> there you go. That's it. See? But that those are the things that you collect and you file away. And that that character is going to wind up in, in, in the book that I'm working on right now. So that's that's what we do. That's what that's that's how I try to spice them up and give them something that you're really gonna you're really gonna keep reading. You know, uh, I in, in my books, my chapters are not long. They, they're longer at the front of the book than the back. The first act, they're a little longer. They get shorter in the second act. Like by the third, exactly. By the third act, man, it's it, it's amping up and it's moving fast. And that also helps the, the, the reader understand the, the, the tension that's building, whether you write it in or not, because it's happening so quickly like that. So it, little tricks that I learned from, you know, some of the masters that, uh, that I've read, been around all my life. Uh, the masters are here behind me. I don't know. Let me let me show you this. 
this is this is my new library that we, we just built not too long ago. Wow. And these are the people that influenced me, that taught me, and this just keeps going and going. These are the people that influenced me and taught me how to write because I read. And that's what I tell everyone. If you're going to be a writer. You can't write if you don't read. That's right. Uh, I had a woman tell me that she'd had like a best list, never read a book in her life. And I talked to her about 30 minutes, realized she had read books. Yeah. Yeah. But she referenced them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so yeah. And I think that was just her shtick. You know, she wanted to do that. And yeah. So that's, that's how that's how it is. You know. Well, gentlemen, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate uh, I, re both I, I, I don't respect being called a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But he is. He's a East Texas gentleman. Revis. <laughs> Revis and Joe, thanks so much for spending this hour. Thank it's you. been great. And uh, just to show everybody again, here's Joe's latest book. And, and it, was, uh, it was a great book. I read it. Book. Yep. Was that like a 60, late 60s caddy, Joe? Yeah, 64, 64 in there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember exactly, but I think it's 64, yeah. 62 maybe. maybe. Incidental, incidentally, I remember watching the, opening scene of Happen Leonard, the TV show, and they destroy that vintage caddy and my heart just. <laughs> they rebuilt yeah. it. <laughs> they rebuilt it. And then here's Revis's yeah. new book. It was um, fine. I'll make you feel better. It was fine. Both of the new books. Thank you. Thank All you. right, gentlemen, have a great night. And thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, stay safe out there. Thank Don't you. See y'all in person for too long. I hope I sure, so. I sure hope so. Thank all y'all. I'm tired of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. All, all right, right. Gentlemen, have a good one. Take care. Thank you now. Bye bye.